Hi guys, uh, welcome to our first online class. Uh, today we're going to do a few things. First, I want to sort of introduce you to uh, how to use this uh, video that uh, you're watching. Uh, then I'm going to go over some basic problems that I saw a lot of people make uh, in your essays. Uh, and then we'll get into a discussion of the story girl and uh, your group discussions and results of those discussions. And then finally, I'll introduce the next unit starting next week, which is creative nonfiction. Okay, first, uh, the video. So I'm using a software, a recording software, that builds an index for each video. If you, uh, when you entered into this window on the right hand side, you had a list of items. If you click on uh, one of those items, it will bring you to the point in the video where I talk about that item. Uh, so you don't have to, you know, find your way through a lengthy video. You can just click on the subject that you want to listen to or re-listen to. Now, the other thing I have to mention is that um, for some strange reason, there's a bug uh, on my laptop computer that I'm using to record this video so that um, if I do anything with the mouse or keyboard, then the recording sound will uh, weaken or even disappear. So let me demonstrate. Uh, throughout this uh, time, I have not been touching the mouse or keyboard. But once I try to move my sound isn't very clear. Uh, and, and so the sound isn't very clear when I move my mouse. Uh, and the same thing happens when I use my keyboard. So um, I'll try to remember not to do things while I'm talking, but if I you know, somehow forget or something, please uh, bear with me. Um, this is new for me too, right? Okay. Okay, let's talk about your essays. So, um, most of you did a pretty good job uh, and uh, but I did notice that maybe the way that I originally wrote this paragraph about quoting evidence uh, may not have been very clear. Sorry, not, not this paragraph, the paragraph below. This paragraph, this paragraph. Um, it says the phrase evidence is a placeholder. Uh, and what I mean is uh, when you write your own essays, take out uh, evidence and put in the actual evidence. So for example, one way of doing this is you simply give me the page where this happens. Another way of doing this is uh, you can give me a direct quotation from the text, uh, which means that inside the quotation marks, every word is identical to the original text. Uh, and you also still have to give me the page where uh, this appears. Um, and, you know, m most of us, when we write, we start off just writing uh, a summary or a paraphrase of the evidence. Uh, but if we realize that it, we end up writing something that's very similar to the original text, I suggest that you turn it into a quotation, uh, add, you know, make it identical, add quotation marks. And uh, that way you can make sure that you are not copying or plagiarizing the original text by mistake. So that you tell me that you do know that this is exactly what the original text looks like. Now, uh, another point is in the first paragraph, notice that uh, I say that you have to quote the sentence or sequence of at most three sentences, which means if you quote more than one sentence, they have to follow one another, they have to come one right after the other in a sequence. It can't just be any random three sentences or even you know three sentences from the same paragraph if they don't come one right after the other. Uh, some of you did make that mistake. Uh, and then finally, when I, uh, once you give a, a quote and you explain why you think it best expresses the main idea of the text. I, I still want to read 
what you think the main idea is. Uh, it's possible to write a good response essay that does not say what you think the main idea is, uh, but I did not see any of you do that. And it's hard to do because if you, uh, if you write down what you think the main idea is, uh, then it reminds you for every paragraph of your essay to return back to this main idea, to connect the idea that you're discussing in that paragraph with uh, what you think is the main idea of the story, and which is also the main idea of your essay. Uh, and the best way to, to make sure that your structure is clear like this is uh, when you introduce the quote that you chose, uh, also say clearly what you think the main idea of the text is. Um, and so that way I know what your essay is going to be about and uh, you will have an easier time keeping it in mind as you write the rest of the essay. Now uh, a few of you, uh, for most of you, if you didn't do that, uh, give me a clear main idea. I still uh, try to figure out what main idea is implied in your essay. And for most of you, it was it was uh, either pretty clear or clear enough. But for a few of you, I, I really couldn't find the main idea. And uh, this usually means that your essay is basically a detailed summary of the text with explanation. Uh, what that means is, um, if the reader is reading the text and reading your essay at the same time, you can say that your essay is giving more information about what the reader is reading in the text. But uh, that kind of essay does not interpret the text. Uh, you don't, uh, you're, you're simply repeating the text in a more detailed and clear way, but you're not giving your own understanding of the text. So when I say main idea, uh, you can think of it like not only are you talking about what the story or the text says, but also what kind of meaning or what meaning can we get from the text? What can we learn from it? What idea does it try to express? Um, and so this will could be different for different people, and the same text can support different ideas of what is the main idea. Uh, different people will have different main ideas. But I do want to see you uh, propose at least one of them, and then for the rest of your essay, for each paragraph, try to connect the, the idea of each paragraph to what you think is the main idea of the text. And if you realize that uh, a paragraph is not related to what you think is the main idea, then either try to build a connection or you can skip over what you wanted to say in that paragraph. Uh, now some others of you um, wrote a clear essay with a, a, a good uh, quotation choice and you gave a clear main idea. Uh, but the, the way that you explained the main idea ignored a lot of the text. So maybe you skipped over some of the important characters, or you didn't talk about uh, another important perspective in the story, something like that. Um, and so if, it, if your main idea truly is the main idea of a story or text, or you know, if you really want to convince me that this is uh, one of the main ideas of the text, then you have to try to uh, explain all of the important parts of the story using that main idea. It, now that doesn't mean that the entire story has to support the same idea. Uh, some parts of the story or the text could complicate or make problems for your main idea. Uh, but in that case, you still have to explain why those other parts or other perspectives are not more important than what you think the main idea is. Uh, and so for some of you, I wrote in the comments uh, to your essay that you have, how do you explain this? How do you explain that? And that's what I mean. 
even if it doesn't agree with your main idea, you still have to try to explain why your main idea is more important than those other parts. Okay, and finally, um, I have graded all of your essays, obviously, that's why I'm talking about them, but uh, Moodle will not notify you when I grade your essay. Uh, which And it, Moodle will not send you an email with my comment. So that means you have to log on to Moodle, go read your own essay, and see what I wrote uh, under your essay on your own. And I encourage you to do that because in this semester you will only be writing three essays before the final exam, which means that you will only have two more chances to try to to uh, to understand how to write uh, a clear and convincing uh, response essay. Uh, so you should, you know, uh, take advantage of every opportunity that you have. Okay, let's talk about the story. So first of all, uh, you'll notice from this image that some groups did not post their uh, discussion results uh, under my post as a reply. So here we have group five and group one, and then uh, if we look at my post, Uh, and thank you for, to some of the groups who included the questions in your answers. So first, uh, who do you think the characters are? What do you think is going on? Uh, most of you said it's a mother and her daughter, or possibly like a, a female elder and a young girl. Um, it's, it's true that we don't know for sure their relationship, but it's safe to say that uh, there are two people. If we look at the story, uh, most of it is written uh, in Roman, which is the regular type of uh, words. And then some of uh, two lines are written in italics, sheti. And it seems like uh, the speaker of these two kinds of type uh, are different. So we have at least two people. Uh, one of them seems to be a little girl or a young girl based on the title of the story, which is girl. And the other would be uh, a mother, at least a mother figure. So someone who plays uh, the role of the mother. And this is if you think there's only two people. Uh, I have taught this story before and some uh, previous students have mentioned that maybe it's uh, not one mother figure, maybe it's like a community of older women. Uh, or maybe uh, it's uh, one person near the beginning when it's talking about all the chores that the girl has to do, and another person later when, let's take a look, when the instructions start to change a bit. Uh, and previously, it's the, how you have to do these things. This is how you do these things. And here you have more like social instructions. Uh, and then you also have like here uh, instructions for uh, different situations, including the situation of the girl herself. So it's not just responding to others, but also how she herself feels. Uh, so, but in any case, it's uh, we can be sure that it's one person who knows a lot about living as a woman in this society and is giving instructions to another uh, person who is probably a younger girl who doesn't know all of this yet. So at least two people. And what do you think is going on? Uh, most of you responded like, uh, the mother figure is teaching the young girl about uh, what they have to do and what she has to do in society. Um, one group mentioned that uh, it also includes, um, so it's not just what you should do, but um, 
Let's see if I can find it. Not just what a young girl should do, but also includes in the stages of a girl to a woman. Thank you, group two. If we look back at the story, good medicine to throw away a child doesn't make sense if uh, the person being instructed is a young girl. She wouldn't have uh, need of this knowledge. She's too young to have a child. Uh, so it seems, and also uh, a, a line further down, this is how a man believes you, uh, seems also more suited for a young woman than a girl. So it's probably likely to say that it's not just one point in time. It's not just uh, the mother figure giving one speech to, to uh, the daughter figure, uh, but it's more like uh, when a young girl grows slowly, gradually grows up into a young woman, uh, these are the messages and instructions that society uh, expects her to know um, as a woman in in this uh, society, and it's these messages are transmitted through elders and mother figures. That that seems to be uh, a more comprehensive and accurate description of what is going on in this story. Question two: What kind of society do you think they live in? How might that affect their relationship with each other? So most of you noted that it seems to be a conservative society, a traditional society, an agricultural society, because there's lots of farm work and yard work. Um, and all of these are uh, pretty accurate. And it's, it's true that uh, uh, only in a conservative kind of society would there be so many uh, in instructions about how to be a, a good girl or a good uh, woman. Uh, but it's also worth noting, as some of you mentioned, that it's not just any conservative traditional society. There are special words in the story that draw our attention to the specific kind of society that it is. Dashin as a kind of food. in Sunday school. These words all point to uh, the possibility that this is a Caribbean society. And in fact, if you go look at the author's background, for example, um, first of all, her name is Jamaica. And of course, Jamaica is a Caribbean country. Uh, some countries or some places, you uh, uh, there is a, a kind of name for children, or they some people name their children after a country, uh, and of course some countries are named after people. So for example, Kenya is a good example. Kenya was founded and named after its founder, uh, I think it was Joseph Kenya or something. And uh, even today some people name their children Kenya, uh, or the female name Kenyatta. Anyway, so Jamaica is could be a person's name, could be a country's name. Uh, Jamaica Kincaid, however, was born in Antigua, part of Antigua and Barbuda, which is a Caribbean country. So, uh, one thing we know about the Caribbean is that it used to be a colony of Western uh, powers, Western European powers. Now, if you know anything about colonialization, you know that there are, uh, in general, two kinds of colonies. The first kind are colonies simply for resource extraction so that the uh, colonial power can uh, uh, grow cash crops like sugar cane or coffee or they can mine for minerals or you know they can set up factories and use the local labor which is cheaper uh, so the point of this kind of colony is simply to make money uh, the second kind of colony is not just about the resources, that's one important part of course, but also, and this applies especially to British colonies, is uh, there's the idea that, or there was the idea that 
white people are better than other kinds of people. So uh, one, another purpose of forming this kind of colony is not just to extract resources, but also to spread Western ideas of civilization, to make the local people civilized, to change how, uh, to, to prevent them, to, to educate them not to participate in their own culture, but to adopt Western cultural practices. And this is one reason why uh, in India today, they drink tea in the British style. Even of course, uh, even though of course tea leaves are grown in India as well. Uh, and from the story, we can see that this is probably the second kind of colony. They have things like Sunday school, and and the mother figure doesn't want her daughter to sing, uh, Bena, which is local culture, during Sunday school. They set the table for tea. Tea is a very Western, especially British thing to eat. Uh, and you have, the idea of setting a table is also tied up with uh, uh, Western European ideas of, of uh, manners and, and civility and civilization. So it seems like in this uh, colonial society, um, the story was published in 1978, but if it was inspired by or even based on the author's childhood experiences, then uh, those experiences would be colonial experiences. Jamaica, when she was younger, it says here, she was born in 1949. So even if it's uh, around the time that Caribbean countries are gaining independence, the colonial social logic still exists uh, in her childhood. So under this kind of society, under this kind of society, uh, a, in, a colonial government is kind of like the opposite of a democracy. You have no participation, particip right, participation in what the government decides, what kind of values the government promotes, what kind of rules the government sets up. Uh, you have no say in how the government rules your lives. And so in a democracy, if you don't agree with the society, you have a chance to protest, to voice your opinion, and maybe change things in society. But in a colonial society, there's an, uh, the chance of that happening is very small. So most people, instead of trying to change the society, instead uh, try to conform to society, change themselves so that they can lead a safer and hopefully uh, more prosperous life by following the rules uh, uh, of this colonial society. So some of you uh, talked to, uh, I think group three in your recording, you didn't write it down, but in your recording you mentioned that it's especially ironic or tragic or brutal that it's the mother figure teaching these things to her daughter. The mother who as a young girl herself probably suffered through this kind of uh, repressive, uh, dissociative social logic. Repression means uh, that you you keep your true emotions to yourself and never express them to others in public, which is not healthy. Dissociation means that uh, you know we all everyone everyone behaves differently at home and, and in school and in public, but uh, dissociation means that the difference is especially great. So how you be behave at home is kind of like a completely different person to how you behave in public, and you have to do this because. In public, the colonial government uh, wants you to behave like a Western person, whereas at home, uh, you get, you can relax and and uh, return to your own uh, local culture, your uh, uh, the culture of the country before the Western colonial government came. And of course, this kind of major dissociation is also not healthy. Um, so in this uh, kind of situation. Uh, if the mother figure feels like she doesn't have a way to improve society for her daughter, then the only way she can help improve her daughter's life is to teach her daughter all the rules that she should follow in order to be uh, considered a good person and be able to get a better life as she grows up. Uh, so that's one way that this society might affect their relationship. 
Question three, why do you think the main warning is against becoming a slut? So first of all, you should know that a slut is the word used to insult women uh, based on the idea that women who have too much sex uh, are not uh, respectable. Uh, and so first of all, what is too much sex? It, there's no objective standard. It uh, depends on the culture and values of each different society. So in a conservative society, uh, it would be uh, eat more. A woman, is, the threshold for being called a slut would be lower. Whereas in an open liberal society, uh, in fact, today, there is a movement against what's known as slut shaming which is the idea that you use sexuality as an insult against women. And there's a movement against this. Because if you think about it, as long as uh, your sexual activities don't affect other parts of your life, then why shouldn't you be able to enjoy uh, sexual activity? It doesn't affect anyone else. Uh, it improves your quality of life. Uh, there's no reason to... I uh, think that having too much sex without affecting uh, other parts of your life, but simply deciding uh, decided based on the amount of sex itself is a bad thing. So uh, the fact that in this society, the word slut can be used as an insult uh, shows how conservative it is. And also, if you notice, it seems like in the story, uh, all of the instructions the mother passes on to her daughter are to prevent her daughter from being called a slut. But a lot of those instructions don't have much to do with sex. So for example, setting a table. This is how you set a table for dinner. This is how you set a table for lunch. And it, it's implied that if you don't do it properly, then people will call you a slut. Why? And, and this has something to do with the fact that this is not only a conservative society, it's also a patriarchal society. Uh, in a patriarchal society, uh, the, the idea is that uh, men have difficulty seeing women as fully human people. And they only uh, can understand women in women's relation to men. Uh, and this often results in what's known as a Madonna whore complex. This. I think in Chinese it's called uh, or something like that. So the idea is, uh, in a patriarchal social logic, women only play two roles for men, two important roles for men. Uh, the, the producer of children and, you know, the caretaker of the family, and the source of sexual pleasure and other kinds of pleasure also. So on the one hand, a Madonna or saint. On the other hand, a whore or a sex worker, someone who uh, whose existence depends on having sex. Uh, and of course, this is an extremely unhealthy way to understand women for the men who are listening to this. Uh, women are fully human. They are basically just like you, except they have a different experience living in society. That's just about it. Uh, but in a patriarchal society, this kind of complex is common. And so that's uh, one explanation for why in this story, you are either someone who follows all the rules or you are a slut. There is no middle ground. So the word slut here is an insult, uh, not just uh, about sexuality, but also about being a proper woman according to the rules of society. And this is something that uh, some of you also thought about. It, uh, it's not just about sex, but it's also about being respectable or being seen as a proper woman. Hey, you know this is a pre-recorded lecture, right? So if you miss things, you can go back and repeat them. If you feel tired, you don't have to keep yourself awake. You can pause, you can jump around, uh, do whatever you want. So in fact, I'll even let you take a short break right now. Don't worry, I'll wait for you. Back? Great, let's continue.
Question four: Do you think there are moments of levity in the story? If so, where? So first of all, the word levity.、Uh, I chose this word for a reason. It's a very. It has a very specific meaning. The root of the word means、uh, light, like、uh, the opposite of heavy, or floating. So, for instance, it's connected to the word levitation. Levitation means floating in midair.、Uh, so, levity is、uh, where the tone of the story becomes light, light-hearted, even humorous.、Uh, so, that's what this question is asking. In this story full of instructions、uh, and repressive. Uh, tone and emotion. Are there moments where the tone changes and becomes a bit lighter?、Uh, and going by all of your answers, it seems like anything that's not a directly understandable instruction strikes you as a moment of levity.、Uh, but let's go through a few moments that I think are、uh, lighter or even humorous compared to the rest of the story. Some of you might be thinking, "Don't walk bareheaded in the hot sun." Might be kind of funny thing,、um, but actually, this is very practical.、Um, if、uh, your culture, the, is, if you live in a tropical, on a tropical island, it's hot all the time,、uh, then your culture likely、uh, does not encourage long hair. And if you have short hair or no hair, and you walk bareheaded under the sun, then your head would get burnt. So it's very practical. Um, let's see what else. Little claws. Little claws are not cute. Little claws are like underwear. This is how you smile to someone you don't like at all. This is how you smile to someone you like completely. Kind of funny. This is starting to become a little lighthearted because. And this is connected to the next question, because this is,、uh, I think, the first time in the story where the girl has a choice: you like someone, you do this; you don't like someone, you do that.、Uh, but I think there are there are funnier moments later. Be sure to wash every day, even if it is with your own spit. Sounds kind of funny. But it's actually pointing to poverty. If you don't have access to clean water that day, you should still try to clean yourself、uh, any way that you can find. Stones at blackbirds because it might not be a blackbird at all. First of all, you shouldn't throw stones at blackbirds, even if they are blackbirds. Blackbirds are incredibly、uh, vicious. And vengeful, and if you attack them, they will remember you for life. They will gather your friends and also go and attack you together. There was a movie about this, Alfred Hitchcock's Birds.、Uh, so you know, don't throw stones at blackbirds. But in terms of this story, it seems to be saying that、uh, a, it seems to be something symbolic. Blackbirds, or you know, bir- any bird that are black, often have a kind of symbolic meaning. Edgar Allan Poe had a poem called "The Raven," where the raven, which is a, a black bird, was the messenger of death. So, if blackbirds could be,、uh, if, if a blackbird is not a black bird, then symbolically it could be like an evil spirit or an evil omen or something that you don't want to be your enemy.、Uh, so, this is more like a traditional belief instruction for the girl. Some of you thought this is how to make good medicine to throw away a child before it even becomes a child, is funny.、Uh, I'm not quite sure why.、And、by the way, this is referring to abortion. If you don't know,、um, it probably sounds funny because it uses simple words because、uh, the the society the society at the time didn't have the word abortion, but that's basically what it means. This one. This is how to throw back a fish you don't like. And that way, something bad won't fall on you. So first off, that is kind of funny、uh, to throw back a fish that you don't like. Not a fish that is too small, not a fish that doesn't look healthy, but that you don't like. Kind of whimsical and light. 
Uh, but the second half of the sentence also brings up a symbolic connection. That way something bad won't fall on you. So it seems to be saying, if you keep a fish that you don't like, you, you catch and kill a fish even if you don't want it, seems to be a crime against nature. And so if you uh, commit crimes against nature, nature will find ways to take revenge on you. The next one is also kind of funny. This is how to bully a man. This is how a man bullies you. There's like a, a back and forth kind of slapstick kind of uh, imagery here. Uh, but it's, if you think about it, it is pretty important. In a patriarchal society, the man of your family or household is the head of the household. You have to follow them. So being able to bully a man with, uh, without being hit or uh, in other ways punished is an important life skill. And, if here, and here bully doesn't necessarily mean like bullying like in, in high school. It simply means uh, being able to argue back or to fight back or to change a man's mind, that kind of idea. Uh, but sometimes uh, you misjudge the line between acceptable and unacceptable behavior and your man might take revenge on you. So the next line is saying, if that happens, this is how he will bully you and this is how you prepare yourself. Uh, the next line, some of you also thought it was kind of funny. This is how to love a man. This is, and if this doesn't work, there are other ways. And if they don't work, don't feel too bad about giving up. So some of you thought this is sexual, and it could be, uh, uh, but it could also be in terms of having a relationship, a romantic uh, partnership. Uh, so it's saying uh, if you, if the relationship isn't working. Don't feel too bad about giving up on the relationship. And this would be an important message in a patriarchal society where uh, society only sees value in women if they are attached to a man, either a father or a husband. So this is also very important life advice. And this is uh, where you start to feel like maybe the mother figure isn't 100% supportive of the social logic that she is passing on to her daughter. Maybe she's doing this simply to help her daughter survive, even in the spaces between the instructions given by society. I remember teaching this story in the past. Uh, one student mentioned that if you look at this, these kinds of uh, instructions that go against patriarchal logic, and you also look at the last sentence, after all, you are really going to be the kind of woman who let the who the baker won't let near the bread. If you read this sentence as not uh, chastising or scolding, but rather kind of uh, a kind of admiration, a positive re uh, a positive reinforcement, then you could read the entire story as saying this is these are the things that society wants you to follow, but I'm tell telling you that there are other ways and that you can still find space for your, uh, for yourself. And so when the girl finally replies with this, what, but what if the baker won't let me feel the bread? It seems to confirm that she has started to find her own path within this patriarchal repressive society. And so the last line is saying, oh, uh, or not oh, but like, yes, that's how you do it. That's how you become a fully grown woman in this society. And good job. I think I'm skipping into the next question. Sorry, going back. This one. This is how to spit up in the air if you feel like it, and this is how to move quick so that it doesn't fall on you. Uh, on the surface level, the literal level, this could be kind of funny as a kind of game to play when you're bored and you don't have other games or other people to play with. You can play this game with yourself. On the symbolic level, it seems to be saying this is how you do uh, things to people without them taking revenge on you, or uh, how you can attack people without being attacked by them, or how you can do things and avoid the consequences. And this, at first it sounds kind of selfish, but it's very important because, again, this is a patriarchal society that doesn't give space for women. So anything a woman does on her own initiative, because she herself wants to do, uh, often will bring a backlash or negative consequences, simply because it's a woman doing something for herself or that she herself wants to do. So this 
uh, lesson could apply not just to you know spitting up in the air, or even not just to attacking people, but to anything that a woman in this society tries to do for herself. It's very important advice symbolically. Some said this might be sexual. Spitting could be a sexual act, but spitting up in the air doesn't seem very sexual to me. Uh, so maybe not, unless you have your own ex uh, it, unless you have an explanation. Uh, for why the entire act of spitting in the air and not being hit by your own spit could be sexual. And if you do have some kind of idea, you feel free to write to me and we can discuss this further. So this seems like a few of the moments of levity in the story that I found. Question 5. Do you think there are hints that the girl may be able to decide her own fate? If so, where? So as we were mentioning for the previous question, in a patriarchal society, women don't have space to decide uh, what kind of life they want to lead, who they want to marry, what kind of job they want to take, or even if they have, uh, or even if there are jobs available for women. Uh, but it doesn't mean that a woman it has to be blindly obedient in everything. Uh, so if there are signs that she can help to decide her own fate or to help shape a little bit of her own life, uh, there are things like as as uh, I think this is group. What group is this? As group four mentioned, uh, uh, making medicine for abortion is is something that a woman can decide for herself. Uh, and notice, uh, this would never be something that um, in a patriarchal society, a man would allow. Because women, again, one of the key roles for women in a patriarchy are is uh, producing babies. So getting an abortion is completely opposite to what a proper lady should do. So this is purely on a woman's own initiative, something that women do for, for their own life and for own, their own quality of life. And then there are all the things that you can do, or that a woman can do in the story for herself. Think about. Um, in the presence of different kinds of men, right? Smiling at someone you, li you don't like, smiling at someone you do like, uh, or sorry, smiling, uh, smiling at someone you don't like, smiling at, smiling at someone you hate. Um, bullying a man, avoiding his return bullying, how to love a man. Uh, all of the a lot of the advice in the in the second half of the story seem to be about the decisions that a woman can make for her own life. Um, and then finally, there is the question of the bread and the baker. Now, obviously, uh, it's symbolic of whether a woman is proper or a slut, whether she can she is allowed to feel the bread or not. Now, uh, if you have never bought a freshly baked bread. You would need to feel the bread to, to make sure how uh, dense it is. Uh, some bread is very light, and there's not a lot of bread in there. There's mostly just air. And that's not nutritious. That's not a good meal, especially in a colonial society that it is, uh, you know, colonial societies are often underdeveloped or even poor because the government doesn't really care about its people. So in a poor society, uh, getting enough nutrition and energy from basic food like bread is very important. So feeling the bread is something that uh, housewives or, or people or you know women who buy the food for the family should do to make sure they're not being cheated. Um, and of course, stale bread, bread is, that's not fresh, is harder. So feeling the bread is important. And if you're not allowed to feel the bread, that means that society thinks you're not a proper woman, you're like a dirty woman, you're like a contaminated woman, and so if you touch the bread, the bread will also be contaminated. It's a symbolic kind of logic. Uh, so that's uh, uh, what the mother is talking about in these three sentences. Uh, you should squeeze the bread. And the daughter asks, what if the baker won't let me? And the mother is thinking the baker will... The, the daughter is probably only thinking, uh, that seems kind of weird. People don't go around squeezing each other's food. Uh, what if the, the baker doesn't let me? Probably. And the mother, on the other hand, is thinking, 
this is what every woman who buys bread does. So if the baker doesn't let you particularly, then it's probably your problem. And if it's your problem, then that means you have become a slut in the eyes of society. Uh, now, again, uh, some people were thinking whether uh, this thing with the bread and the squeezing and the feeling could be sexual. Personally, I don't think so, uh, based on the ex explanation I just gave. But uh, the word squeeze and the word feel do sometimes mean sexual things, which means that even in describing this basic action of proper women, uh, the mother still has to use words that can be sexual. And so the logic of a patriarchal society that divides uh, obedient proper women from women who have sex, uh, this dividing logic breaks down. Uh, because even in this basic act, there is a kind of sexual idea in the background. Uh, but of course, the patriarchal logic uh, doesn't hold up anyway. If one of the uh, duties of an obedient woman is to produce children, how are they going to produce children without having sex? So the basic logic already doesn't stand up, and it's, it's simply uh, a kind of ideology that men use to rule over the women in society in general. Finally, question six. One group did not answer question six. Please remember to answer this question next time. Okay, let's look at uh, what the other four groups wrote for question six, the sentence that you guys chose. So this group, group four, chose uh, the sentence we were just talking about. And for the reasons that we were just talking about, because uh, being able to squeeze the bread or not uh, divides women into proper ladies or sluts. And this division is, is what undergirds this, the social logic of the society. And it, what, it's what decides, uh, what determines what the girl should do to be an accepted and proper part of society and to lead a better life. And it can connect to the experience of the mother and why she has decided to pass on these instructions instead of trying to change things or make life better, uh, make society better for her daughter. And this connects to all the things that we were talking about for the previous questions. Group two. So uh, one choice you guys made was also the same choice for the same reason. The second choice you guys made was you are not a boy uh, talking about squatting and playing marbles, I think. Let's see. I can't find it. Where is it? It's lying from the bottom. Okay, don't squat down to play marbles. Uh, of course, most directly, this is because uh, proper girls and proper ladies are expected to wear dresses. You know, uh, when women first started wearing pants, it was very revolutionary. Uh, dresses were considered to be less sexual because you can't see the shape of a woman's uh, thighs and uh, private parts if they're all hidden under a piece of cloth. But pants, as you know, divide the legs and show the groin area. So that was considered very revolutionary when women started doing that. Now, of course, uh, women wear short shorts and nobody uh, really cares anymore. So uh, if, if uh, the girl is a proper girl, she's wearing a, a dress and then if she squats to play marbles, then her private parts would be exposed. Uh, so this group, you guys are saying, uh, if it was a boy, then would all of the instructions still apply? And obviously the answer is most of them would not apply. A few of them still would. And it's, it's, um, it's uh, worth pointing out that of the instructions that you see in the story, uh, the ones that would still apply for boys and men are ones to do with 
interacting with women. So, for example, how to behave in the presence of men you don't who don't know you very well. Uh, it, this kind of behavior, uh, men should also behave differently in front of uh, women who they don't know, women who they don't like, and women who they really don't like, this kind of thing. And this, you can think of this as a spread of the patriarchal logic controlling women into the sphere of men's actions as well. Uh, it, to, in order to justify a patriarchy, men have traditionally said that uh, women are the fairer sex, fair here means beautiful, or the better sex, because they have to do all the housework, take care of the children, they raise the next generation of human beings. But in fact, uh, this kind of complement is empty because it implies a trade-off. One sex, or one gender, women, uh, do all the hard work and are praised for it, but they don't get to decide for their own life. On the other hand, men uh, don't have to or don't even know how to do all of this uh, work at home, caretaking work, uh, but they do get to decide what kind of career they want, what kind of life they want to lead, where they want to lead this life. Um, and men justify this difference by saying, oh, but all the things I do are to make money to help support you and the children. Uh, but as we now know, it's not up to men to decide whether women, uh, what women decide for their own life. If a woman wants to be uh, a housewife and take care of her children, and instead of developing a career, that's her choice. She, she can do that if she wants to, but it, it's not right for men to say that's what women should do and only do. Um, why are we talking about this? Right, because you are not a boy. Uh, so if the the gender was flipped, then most of the instructions would not apply. Men could choose to do this or choose not to do this, most of the time. Uh, okay, let's look at a different group's choice. Group three, you guys chose on Sundays, try to walk like a lady and not like the slut you are so bent on becoming. Uh, so there's religion here, and there's the idea that the mother doesn't want her daughter to act inappropriately. Uh, so that uh, connects directly to... Uh, the, the mention of being a slut or becoming a slut connects directly to the reason why the mother is passing on these instructions to her daughter. Uh, Sundays... Uh, brings in the idea of religion, and it also brings in the idea of colonialism and colonization, because Christianity is a Western religion. And it's also a patriarchal religion, too. Uh, in uh, Roman Catholicism, Catholics don't allow women to become priests or become, uh, uh, you can say, like, hierarchical members of the church. They can only worship. Uh, and, you know, uh, uh, the phrase God the Father, not God the Mother, uh, Jesus the Son of God, not, not well of course Jesus is a man's name, so uh, th maybe there's something else to be said there, but um, Christianity traditionally has been a very patriarchal religion, uh, and a Western one, and so you can bring those ideas into your essay uh, from that point, the word Sunday in this sentence. Okay, let's look at the last group, because one group, again, did not answer the question. This is the group that didn't answer the question. Okay. You guys also chose uh, the last few sentences. Uh, but you also saw that the daughter's reply shows that she still does have a little bit of space to decide for herself. Um, and you can, this is also symbolized in the fact that the mother replies with a question, not with 
scolding or a statement, but asking, you mean to say you are really becoming a slut? Question mark. So at the, the ending of the story isn't fully determined. There's a little bit of space, a little bit of hope for this young girl who is growing up into a woman to decide what kind of life she wants. And that concludes the short fiction unit of our class. Starting next week, uh, we'll be reading nonfiction. Uh, and this next unit is creative nonfiction, otherwise known as the personal essay. Although, strictly speaking, uh, I, the essays that I chose are not all personal essays. Uh, we'll get to that a bit later. But first, uh, why is it called creative nonfiction? Doesn't that seem a bit weird? Nonfiction we expect to be about facts, what really happened, or how a person really felt. So how could this be creative? The thing is, even if every sentence or every word that you write is true, there are many different ways to write each sentence, and there are many different ways to organize those sentences into an essay. And so the creative part is in, uh, in you can say most of the creative part is in crafting the sentences and organizing the sentences, deciding what to include, what to skip, what to highlight, what to keep in the background. All of these are creative choices. And so even if we're reading an essay that we know, or at least we expect to be true in some sense, uh, the truth of the essay uh, shouldn't take away from the experience of reading the essay as a kind of uh, discovery. And this goes back to the origin of the word essay. The word essay was coined by uh, Montaigne, Montaigne in the 16th century. And the word means attempt, to try. Even today in English, uh, if you use the word essay as a verb, essay, it means to try something. So what, is Mont what was Montaigne trying to do uh, in writing his essays? In his time, uh, nonfiction works were mostly to spread ideas or to promote ideas, sometimes to, to try to convince the king to do something differently, sometimes to try to convince the, the intellectual reading part of the population to believe something. Uh, so it was very organized around facts and arguments. Starting mostly from Montaigne, there are a few early examples, but starting in the West mostly from uh, him, uh, he created a new kind of non-fictional uh, text where the point isn't to convince the reader, but it's to bring the reader along on a journey of thought, to take a subject and to explore all the different ways you can think about it and uh, to explore what each thought leads you toward. Uh, so like one thought leads you to the next thought and the, that thought leads you to the next thought. And you don't, uh, Montaigne didn't even care if he reached a conclusion or not. In fact, he revised his book three, two or three different times, and uh, each time he added more new essays. But if a new essay contradicted an older essay, he made a point not to change the older essay, because he realized that people are paradoxes, we are not consistent machines, and so he wanted a record of his thought processes, and he wanted to bring his readers along to experience the the action and process of thinking itself, and not necessarily what is thought or what thinking leads to, but the act of thinking itself. So starting from the very beginning, the Western tradition of the essay was already a creative tradition. Um, and today, you know, there are argumentative essays, there are explanation essays, but the kind of essay we're going to be reading is the more creative, personal, subjective kind of essay. Um, and so that's uh, the organization, the writing, the selection of elements. All of that is one part of why nonfiction can be creative. Another part is something that has uh, only been uh, being discussed in recent years, like in, in the past 10 or 15 years, which is if you're writing from memory and personal experience, how do you know that you're remembering correctly? 
how do you know that in the process of talking about it or writing about it, you aren't changing things to make it look better or make it look more consistent or to make it even make more sense because a lot of life doesn't make sense. Uh, the current coronavirus pandemic definitely makes no sense at all. Uh, and so if you can't be sure of remembering correctly, if memories are changed in the act of remembering, then every supposedly nonfiction personal essay is also always partly fiction. Uh, of course, if you're writing like a history essay uh, where you have like records and documents you can check, uh, that's a little bit different. It's, it, there are still created parts to writing about history uh, because documents don't tell a story. Stories are made from a link between documents. Uh, but especially for personal essays, remembering things changes things. And so the act of remembering and the act of writing is itself a kind of fiction and creative. And there's a whole different, bigger discussion about uh, uh, what is acceptable fiction in a personal essay and what is not acceptable fiction in personal essays. Usually we believe that uh, as long as the author is making a, a genuine attempt to remember correctly, then it's fine. But if they know that what they're writing is not what actually happened, but they insist on calling what they write, the text that they write, an essay, then usually people don't react very well to that idea. Of course, you can flip that around. A lot of fiction, a lot of novels are based on real life experiences uh, or even uh, directly incorporate uh, like news stories or uh, stories that other people tell them that they, the author actually heard in real life. Uh, but the, the act of including these uh, less fictional elements in a work of fiction turns these elements into fiction. In a sense, uh, you can say that the difference between fiction and nonfiction is a difference in emphasis or a difference in perspective. In fiction, we expect things to be made up mostly. So we pay more attention to how these things are made up, how they are organized, and why the author wants to highlight this instead of that or why the author describes things like this instead of like that. In nonfiction, we mostly expect things to be true, either objectively or subjectively. So the focus becomes more on uh, how does this experience change the person writing about it? Like if, if the essay is about a kind of experience that the author had, how is the author changed before and after this experience? Or why does the author uh, remember things like this, or why does the author describe things like this for the reader? What does the author want the reader to understand or to feel by writing it in this way? Uh, and uh, at the at the more extreme end, uh, essays all sometimes ask you, uh, what would it mean for this to be true? Or what would it mean for people to believe this? So nonfiction or essays are more concerned with uh, the effects of what is being uh, described or what is being told. Uh, whereas fiction is sometimes uh, more focused on the design and the purpose of uh, the story. So you, uh, in nonfiction, you also still have things like characters, except now we call them people. You also still have uh, what in fiction we would call a narrator, the person telling the story. Except in nonfiction, uh, the narrator is more closely related to the author, kind of more closely connected to the author. I noticed in your essays, uh, a lot of you wrote the article and the author. It's not very accurate. The more accurate way to describe stories is the story or text and the narrator, the person telling the story. Every word on the page is part of a story that someone is telling. That person may not be the author because sometimes you have narrators who don't know that they're contradicting themselves who don't know that they don't make sense or who discover things as they tell the story but the author of course knows everything so the narrator is not always the author but in an essay in nonfiction, we we expect the person telling us these things 
to be the author. Of course, again, because it is fully written down already, uh, we know that the person telling us this story or the person writing the essay is not the same as the author. Um, for instance, if an essay is telling you something uh, in, in the present tense, that means that the person talking does not know how it will end. They haven't decided yet. They haven't said it yet. But the author writing it, of course, knows everything. But in, in nonfiction, we don't really focus on the difference between these two as much as we do in fiction. Uh, so in nonfiction, we can say the author persona, which mean, persona means like an identity. Uh, or we can just simply say the author. That's fine, too. Uh, so you have characters, you have narrative, you have uh, the story or plot, but instead of uh, why do things happen like this, what is the connection, uh, wh why why does the story uh, have the characters do this and say that, instead we think about why is this Im important enough to write about in an essay, and how are the different parts of this essay organized and connected from one to the next. Uh, because as we can see from the origin of the Western essay from Montaigne, uh, essays are more about ideas and less about stories. Even if the essay does have a story or even is a story, more important is what idea the author is trying to exp uh, express using that story. Um, and it also has setting, but setting is usually determined by what the author thinks is important in, in the essay. And it also has symbolism too. Uh, but in whereas in fiction, symbolism is kind of above the story or behind the story. Like the characters usually don't understand or don't see the symbols that the reader sees. But in an essay, the symbolism is brought into the essay uh, because the, the description of the thing and the thing itself are both part of the essay. So the literal level and the symbolic level are also both part of the essay. They are uh, not waiting for the reader to discover, but they are a part of what the author wants to convey to the reader. Now, of course, for a fiction writer, it, 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 it's still like this. Uh, fiction writers put in symbols intentionally as well. Uh, but we don't think of them as part of the story, part of the world of the story. Uh, whereas in the essay, it is a part of the world of the story. Because the, especially in a personal essay, the author is the person who experienced the events of the essay. The author exists in that world. There is no separation between the world of the author and the world of the essay, like there is between the world of the fiction author and the world of the story. So if there's no separation between the two, then symbolism is also a part of this world. It's the same world. Um, so these are just some things to keep in mind when you're reading an essay. It's not 100% completely true or accurate, but uh, uh, when the text is called an essay, people usually think of it in terms of, oh, this really happened, or the author really did think or experience this. So for next week, we're starting with this text. I'm broken, mostly friendless, and I've wasted my whole life. Uh, now, this is, strictly speaking, not an essay. What it is, is an agony ant column. Uh, in Chinese, it's called yi nan, yi nan zhan wen. So what happens is uh, newspapers or magazines or now you know online websites will hire people to give advice to readers who write in with their questions. Uh, and this particular uh, agony ant column is about life advice. And you know, there are often, you know, big, serious questions uh, from readers. And so uh, to protect the reader, uh, readers' names are usually uh, anonymous. They give themselves, like, uh, uh, names that describe their situation. So uh, in this story, uh, the, re the reader who writes with a question to ask is named haunted, haunted something. You can read it in the text. But the agony ant is someone that uh, doesn't have to hide their identity. And so the author of this column is Heather Haverleski. 
she is uh, an expert on life advice and mental health and things like that. So it's a, a, a back and forth exchange of letters, basically. Anonymous or Haunted writes in describing her situation and asking, what should I do with my life? Uh, as you can tell from the title, it sounds like a very uh, despairing situation in life or a desperate situation even. And then Haverleski writes a long response uh, trying to answer that question and hopefully give uh, Anonymous a bit of hope. Um, so it's the focus of this text would be on the information, of course, but the way that Haverleski, the both Anonymous and Haverleski explain things is written in an essay style. Um, and you, this uh, text also gives us two characters, uh, which we don't often have in an essay, who don't know each other. Uh, and it's written from two perspectives, instead of the single perspective of most personal essays. Um, so uh, read this before next week. Uh, take the quiz. Uh, discuss the questions with your group members. Uh, and I'll see you next week.